Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. For today's video, we are going to be talking about cardiovascular physiology naman. So, before you watch this video, hopefully you were already able to finish the cardiovascular anatomy video. If you're ready, then let's start. So, I already mentioned to you that the heart is composed of cardiac muscle. My muscle tayo in the atrium called pectinate muscles. We have muscles in the ventricles called trabeculae carnae. And later on, we will study that there is a third type of muscle, and these are specialized excitatory and conductive muscle fibers. We have to understand that the way that the atrium and the ventricular, ventricular muscles would work is almost similar as to how skeletal muscles would work. But one of the most notable difference is that the contraction of your cardiac muscles is much longer. And there is a reason for that which we will discuss in a while. Now, how is the heart able to contract as a unit? Diba? Bakit hindi nawawala sa rhythm yung heart natin? How come it maintains its pace? It maintains its coordination. It's able to do that because the heart has two important characteristics. Una, if you will notice, the cardiac fibers, ang tawag natin doon sa cardiac muscle cell, are cardiac muscle fibers or muscle fibers. No? If you will notice the fibers, they are branching. Connected sila sa isa't isa through the interbranching of these muscle fibers. So because of that, dahil branching sila, nagiging madali for the entire heart to act as one unit. Kung walang nauuna, walang nahuhuli, walang hindi gumagalaw. Lahat sabay-sabay. That's the first reason. And the second reason is the presence of what is on your slide, which is your intercalated discs. By appearance, your intercalated discs could appear as dark areas. Here, it's represented by this darker gray bands that you see. These are dark areas which cross the cardiac muscle fibers. Actually, itong mga intercalated disc natin, they are cell membranes. Uh, from our discussion before of um, cell anatomy, yung cell membrane is the wall of the cell. They are actually walls. No? Yan yung division ng bawat isang cardiac muscle fiber natin. But there is something unique about the cell membranes of the cardiac muscles because meron silang tinatawag na communicating or gap junctions. May mga butas in between those cell membranes which allow them to communicate with one another. And how do they do that? Through the diffusion of ions. So basically, yung action potential that will happen in, let's say, this area will be able to cross very rapidly to the next muscle fiber kasi may proper communication may butas kung saan pwedeng lumusot yung ions natin. That is why, no, they are connected in a series or parallel with one another. Kaya ganun yung arrangement nila. Para, all the parts of the cardiac muscle will be able to beat at the same time and in a certain rhythm. So, the intercalated discs allow the spread of action potentials throughout the cardiac muscles. I also discussed earlier, in the previous video rather, that there is a spiral arrangement of our cardiac muscles. And we call this the lattice work. If you will notice, the cardiac muscles are actually striated. And usually kapag striated, we find that involuntary muscles. Sa mga muscles that we can move on upon our will. Pero itong cardiac muscle natin, it is striated pero it is involuntary. That's why cardiac muscles would also be called striated um, involuntary muscles. Okay? And similar to your skeletal muscles, they also contain actin and myosin. The muscle fibers would arrange themselves in such a way na merong unique arrangement yung atrium, as you can see. No? Para siya naging cup surrounding the atrium. And then, iba rin yung arrangement in the ventricles. 
it formed some sort of a spiral formation. Okay? So, ito yung mga differences na niya from your skeletal muscle. It's different because there is there are two sensations and the cardiac muscles are different because it has more mitochondria. 30% to be exact. No? Compared to the 2% that you will observe in your skeletal muscles. So, as mentioned, this arrangement allows the atria to be relatively thin-walled and the ventricles to be thicker compared to your atria. And the ventricular muscles or the ventricles are able to really do their job as the pumping chambers because of the spiral pattern or the spiral arrangement of the muscle fibers. Now, how is the heart able to do this? How is the heart controlled? No, ano yung ways on how the heart is controlled? Let Let's say, if you're sitting down, relaxing, you would have a normal heart rate, right? Normal lang yung bilis ng tibok ng puso mo. And then, suddenly you heard someone from outside your house shouting, sunog, sunog, no? All of a sudden, you'll notice that your heart starts to beat faster. Like it's coming out of your chest. Or like it's coming out of your mouth. Parang ganun, no? What allows the heart to do that? So now we'll study the controlling center of the heart. The first and the most important control center of the heart is still, of course, neural regulation. Okay? It's still neural regulation. And it is done through the autonomic nervous system. And when we say autonomic nervous system, dalawa yan, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic stimulation. Okay? So like, let's say, that the parasympathetic nervous system was activated. According to our definition here, the parasympathetic stimulation gives a negative chronotropic factor. What do we mean by that? When we say chronotropy, it means heart rate. Bilis ng tibok ng puso. So if it is a negative chronotropic factor, it decreases the speed of the heart. Bumabaga lang tibok ng puso. Okay? Remember that parasympathetic is a negative chronotropic factor. So let's study. How is the parasympathetic nervous system able to do that? So from the brain, it will send a signal to your vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, guys, is one of your cranial nerves. No? So it will send a signal to your vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is connected actually to your pacemaker. Ano yung pacemaker? This is the one that dictates yung bilis ng heart rate natin. So, what it does, the vagus nerve will release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine, it increases the permeability of potassium ions. Meaning, from inside the muscle fibers, potassium will escape when there is acetylcholine. If potassium will escape, what will happen to the membrane potential? It will become more negative because the positively charged potassium is escaping and this will lead to hyperpolarization. When there is hyperpolarization, will there be an action potential? No. Thus, if there is no action potential, it will lead to slow heart rate. Okay? Next, let's talk about sympathetic stimulation. When you activate sympathetic nervous system, it gives a positive chronotropic factor. Basically, it's just the opposite of parasympathetic. It makes the speed or the heart rate faster. Okay? So, how does it do that? It does that by giving a signal via what we call as cardiac nerves. These cardiac nerves are connected to, again, the pacemakers of the heart. Specifically, binanggit yung pacemaker dito, your SA and AV node. So, if the SA and AV node are triggered by the cardiac nerves, it will lead to an increase in heart rate. Moreover, your cardiac nerves will also trigger your atrial and ventricular myocardium, your pectinate and trabeculae carne, leading to a stronger force of contraction. So how does it 
how does it increase heart rate and how does it increase the force of contraction? The cardiac nerves will release epinephrine and norepinephrine. And what these two neurotransmitters will do, it will increase the permeability of the cardiac muscle fibers to sodium and calcium. So, the membrane, the cell membrane will open to allow the entry of your sodium and calcium. And we know that sodium and calcium are more positive compared to your potassium. So, what will happen? There will be depolarization. There will be an action potential leading to faster heart rate and a greater force of contraction. So hopefully you were able to understand that, no? Now, increasing the heart rate or the speed of the heart's beat will also lead to an increase in cardiac output. What is cardiac output? We will have a extensive discussion about cardiac output later, but I want to give you the definition now so that you can understand, no? Cardiac output is the amount of blood released by the heart every minute. It is the amount of blood released or pumped by the heart every minute. So, if the heart beats faster, there will be more blood that will be pumped out, leading to a higher cardiac output. Secondly, the sympathetic stimulation will lead to an increased force of contraction. And this causes a lower end systolic volume. What is and systolic volume. Again, we're going to discuss this extensively in a while, but I want to give the definition now so that we can understand. And systolic, vol systolic volume rather is the amount of blood left inside the heart after contraction. It is the amount of blood left inside the heart after contraction. Kung ilan yung natitirang dugo sa loob. So, if there is a f greater force of contraction, do you think there will be blood left inside? Wala masyado. You will expect a lower end systolic volume. So, the heart empties to a greater extent. Now, the only problem that we see here in sympathetic stimulation, if it is beating faster and if there is a greater force of contraction, the only downside that we see here is that the heart will not have enough time to relax. Yes, the heart also needs to relax in order to allow the blood to again enter the heart. Diba? Yes, the job of the heart is to pump blood, but it won't be able to pump any blood if blood does not go back to it. So it has, it has to have enough time to relax to be filled with a fresh batch of blood, no? And the heart won't be able to do that if there is sympathetic stimulation. So that's for your neural regulation. So just to further clarify this, our sympathetic fibers arise from T2 to T4. This is a segment of our spinal cord. So their job is to increase heart rate and stroke volume. How are they able to do it? They'll send cardiac nerves, right? And the cardiac nerves will release your epinephrine and norepinephrine, increasing permeability to sodium and calcium. While your parasympathetic naman will send a signal via the cranial nerve, vagus nerve. And its job is to decrease the heart rate. And how does it do that? It does that by releasing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which increases the permeability to potassium, and potassium will hyperpolarize the cardiac muscles. Now, I said earlier that the downside of sympathetic is it won't have enough time to relax, right? In the parasympathetic stimulation, the downside is if there will be or if the vagal stimulation will be too strong, it can lead to an AV block. What is an AV block? There will be a blockage in the synchronicity, in the coordination of your atrium and ventricle. So instead of it, you know, pumping one after the other, mag-iiba na. The atrium will pump on its own, 
and the ventricle will pump on its own. When supposedly, they will pump dependent of each other. Magde-depend sila dapat sa isa't isa. But in an AV block, they completely forget about each other and they will just pump on their own. The second controlling center of the heart are our hormones. So these hormones usually come from your adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla are the organs sitting on top of your kidneys, if you still remember. And itong ating adrenal medulla, they, they release uh, these hormones in response to physical activity, to emotions such as excitement, and even to stress. Okay? So, kung excited ka, kung stress ka, it will release these hormones, no? Specifically, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And you know what it does to the heart, right? And lastly, the conducting system, which I will discuss in the next slide. So, when we say conducting system of the heart, ito yung pacemaker. Ito yung mga structures, specialized structures in the heart that gives the heart or dictates yung bilis ng tibok ng puso. And there are several pacemakers in our heart. First, let's talk about the SA node. The SA node is also the sinoatrial node. The other name is the node of Keith and Flack, but for the sake of this discussion, we'll just be calling them as the SA node. It is the primary pacemaker, meaning out of all na mga pacemakers na pag-uusapan natin, siya yung nasusunod. Siya yung nagbibigay ng final say sa kung gaano kabilis sila dapat tumibok. O, kung paano kabilis dapat yung rate and rhythm ng ating heart. How is the SA node able to dictate yung bilis ng tibok ng puso? It's able to do that because it can generate spontaneous action potentials. Meaning, it does not need to be triggered it does not need any stimulus. Hindi, na kailang, hindi siya nakadepend kahit kanino. It can create its own action potentials. Thus, the SA node and actually the rest of the conducting system are called autorhythmic tissue. So, the SA node will create its spontaneous um, action potentials after which it will bring the action potentials to the next pacemaker, which is the AV node. So it has to pass through the atrial muscles and it will reach your AV or atrioventricular node. The SA node is located in the right atrium. Specifically, it's very near the opening of your superior vena cava. In fact, the, the complete description it's at the septal wall of your right atrium, immediately below and slightly lateral sa gilid no? or sa labas ng ating superior vena cava. Now, the SA node has a firing rate of 90 to 120 beats per minute. That's why the normal heart rate is around this range as well. Okay, kasi yan yung firing rate ng ating SA node. So, after the SA node creates the action potentials, it will send the action potentials to the AV node via what we call internodal pathways. Yan yung daanan ng action potential from SA to AV node. And there are three. Your anterior, which is also known as Bachmann's. Your middle, which is also called Wenkebach. And your posterior, which is also called your Thorels. So, Itong tatlong ito, they are embedded in your atrial muscle. So, dyan dadaan yung action potential before it can reach your AV node. If you will notice, one part of the backman's bundle or the backman or yung anterior natin will also go to the opposite um, atrium. Kaya the left and the right atrium still no beats at the same time. The second... Um, pacemaker in the heart is your AV node or atrioventricular node, also known as the node of Kent and Tawara. It is considered the junctional node kasi yung location niya is right in between the ventricle and the atrium. Nandun siya sa junction. 
the action potentials um, that have been passed on by your SA node via the internodal pathways will be conducted slowly by your AV node. Okay? So, why does it do that? Because it ensures that the ventricles will receive the signal first. No? It will receive the signal only after mag-contract ng atrium. Okay? Binabagalan ni AV node yung transmission ng signal kasi pinapauna niyang mag-contract si atrium. Pag nag-contract na si atrium, ipapasa na ni AV node yung action potential para si ventricles naman yung mag-contract. Okay? Kaya nga, mauuna yung atrium natin para magkaroon ng laman na blood yung ventricles natin. Hindi sila pwedeng sabay talaga. So, the atrium goes first, it contracts first, so that blood will be pushed towards the ventricles. And then, yung ventricle naman magkocontract to push the blood towards the aorta or the pulmonary trunk. So, the location of your AV node is behind the tricuspid valve. Sa likod siya ng tricuspid valve natin. And it is the most common site of heart block, as mentioned, yung AV block natin na tinatawag. Now, in the case that your SA node will be damaged, the AV node will take over. Para siyang first runner-up. No? If, if the SA node will not be able to perform its duties and functions, then the AV node will take over. However, the firing rate of your AV node is only 40 to 50 beats per minute. After which, it will now go to the AV bundle. Ito yung AV bundle natin. This is the short segment which enters the cardiac skeleton to in order for it to reach, oh, what is this area? Your interventricular septum. No? So it has to pass through a hole in the cardiac skeleton para makaabot siya ng interventricular septum. Now the AV bundle is quite interesting because it also acts as an insulator. So para siyang insulator, no? um, it prevents yung direct transmission ng impulse from the atrium to the ventricle. Siya yung nag-check muna uh, para siyang check and balance. So hindi niya ina-allow to just accept the impulse, it makes sure muna that the ventricle really has contracted before sending it over to your to the rest of the pacemakers. After the AV bundle, it will split into two, the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. Hanggang apex lang yung right and left bundle branch natin. Hanggang apex lang sila. So they extend beneath the endocardium hanggang umabot sila sa apices, sa apex natin. Afterward, it will travel laterally, no, sa lateral walls ng ating heart, and they will be called Purkin G fibers, which is composed of large diameter cardiac muscle cells na merong konting myofibrils. And what's unique about them, it contains many gap junctions, allowing action potential and ions to spread faster in the ventricular muscle cells. Okay? As a summary, we have this table showing the difference between skeletal and muscle physiology. So, sabi ko kanina, di ba, na almost same yung nangyayari in the skeletal and cardiac muscles. So, in the skeletal muscles, the action potential travels along the length of your single fiber. I'm sure na-discuss na to sa FAPM, no? Nagtatravel yung action potential along the sarcolemma. But in the cardiac muscles, nagtatravel ang action potential from cell to cell. Nakaka-spread nakaka sila from cell to cell because of the intercalated disc and the branching formation of your cardiac muscles. Moreover, sa skeletal muscles, heavily nagre-rely tayo sa sodium channels natin or sa sodium ion mismo. But in the cardiac muscles, we rely both on fast sodium channels and slow calcium channels. Later on, when we discuss yung cardiac action potential, you will know the significance of this too. In terms of bilis ng pag-transfer ng action potential, mas mabilis talaga in the skeletal muscle because they have larger diameter fibers. Sinabi naman natin yan, di ba, in your fiber type A, type B, type C. The larger the diameter, when it is myelinated, mas faster talaga yung transmission. And in the cardiac muscles, slower yung transmission kasi smaller yung diameter ng fibers. And later on, there is a great reason kung bakit mabagal 
yung rate of action potential propagation in your cardiac muscles. So here is the diagram or the curve of, card of action potential in our cardiac muscles. So similar to your skeletal, the resting membrane potential is still negative 90 millivolts. At ang kakaiba, the action potential of your cardiac muscles has a plateau. It somehow has a flat top. Unlike your skeletal, no, talagang may peak. Dito, may flat top siya. And the duration of action potential is longer. Matagal yung action potential. And bakit siya matagal? Bigay na natin yung reason. Because makilangan matagal yung action potential at kailangan hindi ulit magkaroon agad ng action potential in order to allow the heart to relax. Di ba binanggit ko kanina yon? Kailangan magkaroon ng time ng heart mag-relax or else walang blood na papasok sa heart natin. Magiging ineffective siya as a pump. So let's talk about the different phases of your cardiac action potential. Of course, it will start in your resting membrane potential of negative 90 and then there will be depolarization. Napansin ba ninyo na wala tayong sinabing any triggers because in your cardiac muscles, merong spontaneous no, generation of action potentials. So, there will be an opening of your fast sodium channels. They, they, they were described as fast kasi ang bilis ng pagpasok, ang bilis ng opening and ang bilis ng closing ng sodium channels na yan. So, once it opens right here, Sodium will immediately enter the cardiac muscle, leading to the more positive transformation of your um, cell membrane. So, magiging very positive siya, thus umaangat yung ating action potential. And then, kung gaano kabilis yung pag-open, ganun din kabilis yung closure. This, your x-axis, this is your time. So, imagine, ang bilis lang, no, nag-open, bigla nag close na rin kaagad. So the closure of your sodium channels is already a part of your phase 1 or the initial repolarization. Doon magsisimula. Pag nag close yung sodium channels mo, papasok na ang phase 1. There will be stoppage of the influx of sodium and then if you will notice, magkakaroon ng slight decrease. No, biglang bababa slightly yung potential natin. Yung, volt, yung voltage natin. And why is that? Because there is a leakage of your potassium ions. So there, because of the leaking potassium ions, slightly it will go down. That's phase 1. Initial repolarization. Phase 2 is the flat top or the plateau. Bakit nagkakaroon ng plateau? So, there will be an opening of your calcium channels and we describe calcium channels as slow calcium channels. Meaning, mabagal yung opening, mabagal din yung closing. Diba? Ang tagal bago siya nag-open, oh. dito pa siya nag-open banda. Tagal bago nag-open, pero matagal din bago nagsara. No? So, because of the opening of your calcium channels, there will be inward current of your calcium. And again, calcium is more positive than your potassium. So, even if nagli-leak yung potassium mo, hindi masyadong bumababa yung action potential membrane natin or membrane potential natin kasi pumapasok naman ng calcium. During this time also, it prevents summation and tetanus meaning hindi pwedeng magkaroon ng action potential during the plateau phase. Bakit hindi pwede? Kasi it should allow the heart to relax. And this brings us to phase number three, which is repolarization. During this time, calcium channels will close. So, walang pumapasok na sodium, walang pumapasok na calcium. And then, magkakaroon ng opening of your potassium channels. Because of the opening of your potassium channels, bukod sa nagli-leak na siya o open pa yung ibang channels, bababa na ngayon yung ating membrane potential. It will go down until it reaches phase 4 which is your resting membrane potential again. Okay? So usually your RMP is around negative 88 to negative 90. 
So here is a summary of everything we've mentioned. But what I want to highlight here is your refractory period. If you still remember, we described refractory period as a part or as a duration of time, period in the action potential, na hindi pwedeng masundan ng another action potential. Ta? So we call that absolute refractory period. That's the meaning of your absolute refractory period. The cardiac myocytes cannot be excited again. And usually, it starts from phase 0 until the first part of phase 3. From phase 0, depolarization. Tapos, initial repolarization. Plateau until, uh, until repolarization. Yun yung absolute refractory period mo. And then, after first half ng, ref ng ating repolarization phase, papasok na ang relative refractory period. What is relative refractory period? If there is enough stimulation, and if the stimulation is strong enough, then an action potential can again arise during this period. So, if you will notice, the duration, yung entire duration ng action potential is also the entire duration of your muscle contraction. Okay, so pagpasok dito, from phase 0 until bumagsak, yan ang buong action potential mo. At bakit ganong katagal? Bakit siya longer compared to skeletal muscles? Again, it needs to give enough time for the heart to fill with blood. Next, we'll be talking about the cardiac cycle. So the cardiac cycle refers to all events associated with blood flow the heart from the start of one heartbeat to the beginning of the next. So when we talk about cardiac cycle, ang pinag-uusapan natin dito is what happens inside the heart for every event, no? Ano nangyayari sa loob from the time na papasok yung blood until makalabas yung blood? What are the events that happen inside? So a cardiac cycle consists of two major parts or two major phases. Those are diastole and systole. So when we say diastole, this is defined as the period of relaxation. And as mentioned, repeatedly mentioned actually, that during the period of relaxation, this is when the, the heart is being filled with blood. On the, sec on the other hand, we also have systole, which is the period of contraction where blood is um, expelled from one area to the next. So, systole, sorry, diastole is also called ventricular relaxation. So, when we talk about systole and diastole, these are events no, which are um, more commonly refer to the ventricle. Kung ano nangyayari sa ventricle. So, diastole is ventricular relaxation. And why is there a need for relaxation? So, because it needs to be filled with blood. So, the ventricle must be able to stretch in order to accommodate the ventricular feeling. As mentioned kanina, nung diniscuss natin yung um, pericardium, no? Dapat may ability yung heart natin to stretch, to expand in order to accommodate yung amount of blood na pumapasok. Next is your systole, which is ventricular contraction. And the ventricle must be able to contract, to build up enough pressure, to create enough force in order to eject the stroke volume. So, ano naman yung stroke volume? If you still remember kanina, yung cardiac output natin, yun yung amount of blood na lumalabas sa heart natin for every minute. The stroke volume is the amount of blood naman that comes out of the heart for every pump. Okay, so each contraction or each pump of the heart, each beat of the heart, the, the amount of blood that goes out is your stroke volume. Now, diastole and systole is governed by a physics law called Frank-Starling law. Why is the Frank-Starling law important? Because according to the Frank-Starling law, so it states that the preload which is the degree of stretch ng cardiac muscles natin before the contraction is critical to controlling the stroke volume. So, i must discuss natin siya in the next slide. So, it's telling us that the energy of contraction, yung force of contraction, is directly proportional to the initial length 
of the cardiac muscle fiber. Ang ibig sabihin, kung mas maraming dugo ang papasok inside the heart, then the heart will be stretched. And the more it is stretched, the greater the force of contraction ang ibibuild ng heart natin in order to make sure that greater quantity of blood din ang lalabas. Basically, in mathematical equation, the force of contraction is directly proportional to the amount of blood and it is directly proportional to the stretching of the heart. So remember that word, preload. Preload is the degree of stretching. So the more it is stretched, the greater the force of contraction. At kung greater ang force of contraction, greater ang stroke volume. Yung amount of blood na lumalabas sa heart natin. So, now let's talk about the different events that happen during diastole. So, in diastole, as mentioned, it is your ventricular relaxation. So, ano nangyayari doon? There is rapid filling of the ventricle. Napupuno ng dugo ang ating ventricle. And this happens in three different phases. Yung first third, middle third, and the last third of your um, rapid feeling. During the first third of the ventricle, sorry, during the first third of diastole, bubukas ang ating AV valve. If the AV valve opens, then passively, kusang babagsak ang dugo from the atria to the ventricle. Okay? So what happens in the first third? Your AV valves will open, allowing the passive flow of blood from atrium to ventricle. How much of the blood? 75% of them. During the middle third of diastole, blood coming from your superior vena cava and blood coming from your inferior vena cava will continuously flow from your atrium to the open ventricle. Bakit open ventricle? Because your AV valves are still open. So pag nag-flow ang blood from SVC, diretsyo na siya to your ventricle. And the last third is what we call as atrial systole. Ano yung atrial systole? It is the contraction of the atrium. So what will happen during this time, yung natitira pang blood in the atrium, i-force na yon ng atrium mo towards the ventricle by contracting itself. No? Iko-contract niya yung sarili niya para bumaba yung blood papunta ng ventricle. And then, the AV valves will close. So here is another image showing us what we have just discussed, no? yung tatlong phases ng ating rapid feeling of the ventricles. So the first third is the rapid phase, that's the um, continuous flow, I mean the passive flow of blood from the atrium to the ventricles. The second half, the second third rather, is the diastasis where blood just continues to flow after it is emptied into the atrium and the last is your atrial systole the contraction of the atrium in order to bring back blood or to deliver blood from atrium to the ventricles the next phase of our cardiac cycle is systole and systole is divided into three events first is isovolumic contraction the second is the period of ejection and the last is isovolumic relaxation. So let's talk about them one by one. During the period of isovolumic contraction, um, blood is still in the ventricle. So remember, no, we ended diastole with the closure of the AV valve. So tapos na yung tatlong phases. Continuous blood, uh, sorry, passive blood flow, continuous blood flow, and atrial systole. Afterwards, the AV valves will close. So, all the blood is already in the ventricle. Wala nang maa-add, wala rin mababawas. So, what happens during that time? So, this is the beginning of systole, yung isovolumic contraction natin. And the ventricle should start to contract in order to create pressure. So, magsa-start mag-contract yung ating ventricle. Kaya nga siya, period of contraction. But there will be no change in terms of the volume. Yes, may movement yung ventricle natin, pero walang nababawas doon sa volume of blood that is already in your ventricles. 
So why is there a need for the ventricles to contract? It needs to create enough pressure that will open your semilunar valves. Whether it be pulmonic semilunar valve or the aortic semilunar valve. Dapat maka-create yung ventricles natin ng enough pressure. Just enough to open up your semilunar valves. So basically, we call it again period of isovolumic contraction because pressure increases, there is a start of contraction but there is no change in volume yet. Once that once the pressure is enough, then we will go to the period of ejection. So yung pressure or the amount of force required to open your semilunar valves is called afterload. So yung preload kanina ko naalala nyo pa, preload is the amount of stretching of your ventricles. Now the afterload is the amount of force required to open your semilunar valves. And the afterload are, for the right ventricles, just 8 millimeters mercury. For the left ventricle, 80 millimeters mercury. So the period of ejection is also subdivided into two. The first third is, um, the first third of ejection, it's able to release 70% of the blood and we call this the period of rapid ejection. And the last third of ejection, around 30% ang lumalabas na blood and we call that slow ejection. So again, during the period of ejection, the ventricular pressure will push open the semilunar valves. And the pressure that opens up the semilunar valves is called the afterload. The afterload of the right ventricle is 8 millimeters mercury, while on the left, it's 80 millimeters mercury. The period of ejection is divided into periods, di ba? Sabi ko kanina, the first third, rapid ejection, 70%. The two-thirds is slow ejection, 30%. Okay? And the last... Uh, phase of your systole is the period of isovolumic relaxation. So by this time, the semilunar valve will now close. Okay? So at the period of isovolumic relaxation, both the AV valve and the semilunar valves are closed. And since wala nang laman na blood, yung ating ventricles the ventricle will now start to relax. So, there is again movement in the ventricles, there's relaxation, but there is no change in the volume. Walang nadadagdag, wala rin nababawas na blood inside the ventricles. Thus, ventricular pressure will go down. So again, in isovolumic relaxation, it is the end of systole. All valves are closed. The ventricular muscles will relax, causing a decrease in your ventricular pressure. So that's it for your cardiac cycle. Let's continue and talk about hemodynamics naman. So when we talk about hemodynamics, it is the study of blood flow. So now we will study how blood is distributed, um, what are the factors that play into the, the, the speed, the pressure that allows blood to be um, propelled into the different parts of the body. So when we talk about hemodynamics, it integrates science, biology, chemistry, and physics. And I want you to take note that what we will study here in hemodynamics, towards the end of the discussion, magkakaroon tayo ng parang summary of everything we have already discussed. So first concept I want you to understand in hemodynamics is the term total peripheral resistance. Total peripheral resistance. This is described as the impediment to blood flow. Siya yung pumipigil for blood to flow. And total peripheral resistance is determined by two factors. First is the diameter of the vessel. So as we can see here, no, the bigger the blood vessel, the lower the resistance. And the smaller the blood vessel, the greater the resistance. When you think about it, it's similar to how we try to drink our soft drinks in the bottle. So when you try to drink soft drinks in a bottle and you use a big straw, the flow of soft drinks will be smooth. It will be fast, right? Mabilis mo maubos yung drink mo. But if you try to use a smaller straw, let's say straw for like Zesto, 
or your Tetra Pak drinks, no? Since maliit yung diameter, there will be greater resistance and mas matagal bago mo mauubos yung drink mo. You need to exert more effort, more force into sipping um, the fluid out of the straw, no? So, same lang din in terms of blood flow. If the diameter of your blood vessel is big, blood flow will be faster because there is no impediment. But if it is smaller, there will be greater impediment, thus greater resistance. The second factor which um, affects your TTR is blood viscosity. Yung lapot, the thickness and the thinness of blood. Of course, when blood is thin, there will be less resistance. No? And when the blood is thick, sabihin maraming solutes, there are many substances inside, there will be greater resistance. Similar to when you have like, let's say, um, when you put sugar into water, or yeah, when you, when you make your coffee, and you add a little bit of sugar, then mas smooth, no? It, it's, it feels more evaporated, parang ganun. Parang evaporated milk. But if there's more solutes in that, um, in that coffee, parang condensed milk yung ilalagay mo doon sa coffee mo. Mas viscous kasi siya. So, more viscous, more resistance. Okay? The total peripheral resistance can also be affected by several factors. First is aging. So, ano ba nangyayari sa aging? We lose the elasticity of our vessels. Um, tumitigas yung mga blood vessels natin. So, if they cannot open anymore, puro lagi na lang silang closed, there will be more resistance. Second is increasing heart rate. So, kung mas mabilis yung heart rate mo, there will also be increase in resistance. And then, aortic pressure or the afterload. So, kung mataas yung afterload mo, tataas din yung resistance mo. Afterload is the pressure you need to open up the semilunar valves. So, kung mataas yung pressure na kailangan mo, mas mahihirapan yung blood mag-flow. Right? Next is arterial pressure. So, arterial pressure is the force exerted by the blood against the vessel wall. So, like ito, this is your heart, no? The heart will pump blood. Once blood enters your arteries, the blood will exert an effort towards the vessel wall. Meron siyang pushing capacity. And that pushing capacity is your arterial pressure. It is expressed in millimeters mercury. And we have several types of arterial pressure. The first is systolic pressure. So it is the highest arterial pressure as you can see in this diagram. So, usually, ang ating systolic pressure or the pressure in the blood vessels um, after the heart pumps blood no, is 120 millimeters mercury. Okay, 120 millimeters mercury. Now, during the time of relaxation at walang blood na dumadaan sa blood vessel natin, that is your diastolic pressure, the lowest arterial pressure. And usually, it has a value of 80 millimeters mercury. When you divide, or sorry, when you subtract your systolic pressure from your diastolic pressure, the difference is called pulse pressure. Okay? Yung difference between systolic and diastolic pressure is called pulse pressure. And getting the normal values of 120 less 80 will get a normal value of 40. Next, let's talk about volumes. I was already able to discuss ESV kanina, no? So, this is again the amount of blood left after systole or after ventricular contraction. So, normally, its normal amount is 50 ml, 50 ml only. While your end diastolic volume, yan yung amount of blood inside the heart during relaxation. This is the amount of blood bago magkaroon ng contraction. Okay? Amount of blood inside the heart before contraction. So, normal value, 120 ml. And stroke volume, as mentioned, is the amount of blood that is pumped by the heart for every contraction. So, you simply have to subtract your EDV, your starting volume, from your ending volume. 
So, the normal value would be 70. Kasi 120 minus 50, hindi 850. So, normal value is 70. Next. So, what are the factors that regulate your stroke volume? Anong mga factors daw yung mag affect sa ating stroke volume or the amount of blood na lumalabas for every pump? Siyempre, unang-una dyan is your preload. Remember, Frank Starling Law? The more blood is inside, the greater stretch ang mangyayari sa ating um, heart muscle. So, pag greater yung stretch, greater din yung contractility. ba? So, it, contractility is the forcefulness of the ventricular muscles. And then lastly, your afterload. The afterload is the pressure needed to open your semilunar valves or the pressure needed to be overcome before ejection of blood can happen. So, ang ating stroke volume, banggit ko kanina yung stroke volume, no? Your stroke volume is actually a component of your cardiac output. Ano ba yung cardiac output? It's the amount of blood pumped by the heart per minute. So, you can get the value of cardiac output by multiplying your stroke volume or the amount of blood na nakukuha mo for every minute multiplied by your heart rate. Or, Ilang, na, ilang beats ba meron yung heart natin in a minute. So, if you multiply the two, you'll be able to get the cardiac output. And the normal value is 4 to 6 liters. So, by studying the mathematical equation, since multiplication yung ginamit, no? ibig sabihin na to, they are directly proportional. Meaning, any increase in heart rate will lead to an increase in cardiac output. Any increase in stroke volume will lead to an increase in cardiac output as well. And any decrease in the two will also lead to the decrease of your cardiac output. So, what are the factors that regulate your heart rate? Nabanggit na natin to kanina. Neural regulation, di ba? Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Kapag sympathetic, positive chronotropic factor. They will activate your cardiac, um, cardiac nerve. And then, maglalabas ng epinephrine or epinephrine. Increase permeability to... Um, sodium and calcium. Parasympathetic naman will trigger the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve will release your acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will increase permeability of calcium. Hormones as well. Nabanggit na natin yung dalawang hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, produced by your adrenal medulla. ba? So now, let's go to the pressures needed or found in the veins. So, the first pressure is MCFP or the mean circulatory filling pressure. You only have to understand here that this is the pressure that brings back blood to the heart. Okay, this is the pressure that brings back blood to the heart. So, the higher MFCP, the higher amount of uh, blood will go back to the heart. Okay, so MFCP is determined by your Total blood volume divided by vascular capacity. So, si MCFP at total blood volume, directly proportional. Kung mas maraming blood volume, mas malaki din yung MFCP. Kung mataas naman yung vascular capacity, bababa ang MFCP kasi indirectly proportional sila. Pag tumaas si VC, bababa ang MFCP. Pag bumaba si VC, tataas ang MFCP. So, ano ba yung TB and VC? TB is total blood volume, while VC is vascular capacity. Next is central venous pressure. So, sinabi ko na kanina, no, MFCP is the pressure found in the veins, kasama na dyan ang superior and inferior vena cava, that will bring back blood to the heart. So, the higher MFCP, the higher amount also of blood that will return. However, merong pwedeng pumigil doon sa pagbalik ng blood towards the heart. And that is your central venous pressure. Why? This is the pressure found in the right atrium. Remember, the right atrium is the recipient of deoxygenated blood from all parts of the body. So, if mataas ang CVP, mape-prevent ang normal blood flow pabalik ng ating right atrium. Okay? So, if you will notice here, no? An increase in CVP will mean a decrease in venous return. Dahil mataas yung pressure sa loob ng right atrium, hindi makapasok ang blood. 
So putting um, putting the concepts together, uh, we know now that arterial blood pressure, okay, blood pressure is a product of cardiac output times peripheral resistance. Okay? Cardiac output times peripheral resistance equals blood pressure. And ang ating cardiac output is determined by two things, stroke volume and heart rate. At ang total peripheral resistance natin, ito ay dictated by vascular structure, yung sinasabi ko kanina na vessel diameter, and vascular function, yung viscosity ng blood natin. So let's use this two as an example. If there will be increased stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, what will happen? There will be vasoconstriction. Ano mangyayari pag may vasoconstriction? Liliit yung daanan ng dugo. There will be decreased diameter. So, pag nag-decrease ang diameter, nag-decrease ang vascular structure, magde-decrease din ang peripheral resistance. Again, anong relationship ng dalawang to? Directly proportional. So, pag bumaba ang peripheral resistance, sorry, kapag nag-increase ang peripheral resistance, kasi lumiit yung vessel, mag increase din po yung BP natin. Okay? So, it will lead to increase in PPR and increase in BP. Next, we have a few more formulas. Cardiac work. Ano ba yung cardiac work? It is the effort of the heart for every contraction. So, how do we get that? We multiply the ABP that the heart has to overcome to propel blood out of the heart times stro uh, stroke volume. So, ABP times stroke volume is the cardiac power. If you want to know cardiac... Uh, sorry, that's cardiac work. If you want to know cardiac power naman, you multiply ABP by the cardiac output. Now, sabi natin kanina, venous return, no? The higher CVP, the lower yung venous return natin. So, kailangan mataas ang MCFP para tumaas din ang venous return. So, paano ba bumabalik ang blood pabalik ng puso? It is through the help of venous valves. So, even in the veins pala, meron tayong valves, no? Para hindi magbabackflow yung blood pabalik ng mga legs natin, let's say. Kaya, able yung mga veins natin to bring back blood to the heart kasi meron silang veins. So, paano naman sila napupunta sa taas? Ini-squeeze sila by our skeletal muscles. Okay? Sa pag-squeeze ng skeletal muscles natin, blood is pushed up papunta ng right atrium. So, blood pressure, katulad ng iba pang mga pressures natin, is controlled by three parts. Nervous control, sympathetic, parasympathetic, your capillary fluid shift, which we will discuss later, and renal fluid volume mechanisms. So, unahin na natin yung nervous control for blood pressure. So, actually, may isang part ng brain natin na nagkocontrol ng BP. That is your medulla. Please remember that. The medulla is the vasomotor center. Kino-coordinate niya at ini-integrate ng medala lahat ng nagre-regulate sa ating cardiovascular system. So, yung medala natin, meron siyang dalawang parts. Yung tinatawag na cardiac inhibitory center and cardiac activating center. Si cardiac inhibitory center, siya rin yung parasympathetic. So, kapag si medala inutusan yung kanyang CIC to activate, i-activate ni CICC parasympathetic. And if the medulla chooses to activate your CAC or cardiac activating, it will also lead to the activation of your sympathetic nervous system. So, another part of our uh, nervous control is immediate regulation. So, yung baroreceptors natin, these are responsible, remember this, for the short-term regulations of blood pressure. Again, baroreceptors are responsible for the short-term regulations of blood pressure. And there are two types of baroreceptors. One is found in your neck area called carotid sinus. And the other one is found in our heart, specifically in the aorta. Thus, it's called aortic, sin aortic sinus. So, ang gagawin ng mga baroreceptors na yan, manonotice nila if merong decrease or increase in the stretching of the baroreceptors. Pag na-increase ang stretching ng baroreceptors, ibig sabihin nun mataas masyado ang BP. So what will it do? The baroreceptors, kunyari mataas ang BP, no? the baroreceptors will send a signal to your medala. The medala 
Pag mataas ang BP, will activate cardiac inhibitory center, CIC. Ano ang gagawin ni cardiac inhibitory? It will trigger parasympathetic stimulation. And it will stop sympathetic. Okay? So, ano mangyayari pag na-activate ang ating parasympathetic? Lalabas ang acetylcholine through the vagus nerve. At anong gagawin ng acetylcholine? It will increase calcium, sorry, potassium permeability. Okay? Ganun yung mangyayari. Our baroreceptors can also be found as peripheral chemoreceptors. So, itong mga chemoreceptors naman, nade-detect naman nila if bumababa yung level ng ating oxygen sa dugo. So, if it uh, goes below 80 millimeters mercury of oxygen, ma-activate na po yung peripheral chemoreceptors. And lastly, your central chemoreceptors. So, ano naman ang hinahanap ng central chemoreceptors? The level of your carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion. So, this is another regulation na na-mention kanina, capillary fluid shift. So, let's say mataas ang BP ni patient. If mataas ang BP, then there will also be increased capillary pressure. So, what will happen pag mataas ang capillary pressure natin? Blood will be pushed out of your blood vessels. So, lalabas ang dugo out of the blood vessels. And makakaroon ng decrease in blood volume sa loob ng vessel. Since lumabas yung dugo, mababawasan yung dugo sa loob ng vessel natin. So, madedetect yun ng ating heart. Ay, bumaba yung blood volume. Well, what will it do? It will decrease your MCFP. So, pag nag-decrease ang MCFP, MCFP is the pressure needed to return blood back into the heart, bababa rin ang venous return. Pag bumaba ang venous return, bababa ang ating um, cardiac output. Pag bumaba ang cardiac output, bababa ang BP. Next is stress relaxation mechanism. Ano namang nangyayari? So, when we are stressed, or pwede rin na during relaxation, pwedeng bumaba yung ating blood pressure. Pag bumaba yung blood pressure natin, magdi-decrease yung pressure sa ating mga walls. Bababa yung arterial pressure, no? Because of this, magkakaroon ng recoil. Biglang magbabounce yung vessel walls kasi nag-relax siya bigla. Because of this, there will be increased MCFP. Pag nag-increase MCFP, tataas ang venous return. Increase in venous return will lead to increase in cardiac output, thereby causing the increase in BP. Next is capillary filtration in the kidney. So, alam natin, di ba sa kidney, meron tayong juxtaglomerular apparatus na capable of monitoring BP. So, let's say, bumaba ang ating blood pressure. Pag walang masyadong blood pressure, wala rin masyadong arterial flow or renal artery flow. Konti lang yung dugo na papasok sa kidney. Pag konti lang yung pumasok na dugo inside the kidney, bababa rin yung glomerular capillary pressure. Pag bumaba yung glomerular capillary pressure, bababa din yung filtration pressure kasi walang dugo. So, anong filter niya? Wala. ba? Diba? So, kailangan niyang ibaba yung pressure to allow the filtration of blood. So, kapag nangyari yon, pag bumaba yung filtration pressure, tataas yung ating filtration rate. So, what will happen? Mareretain yung ating sodium at magde-decrease yung urine formation natin. So, since hindi na lumalabas ang ihi at nagkaroon pa ng sodium retention, tandaan natin, where sodium is, water will be. So, since nasa loob ng katawan ng sodium at hindi tayo gumagawa ng ihi, tataas yung blood volume natin. Pag tumaas ang blood volume, there will be more blood that will go to the right atrium. Pag tumaas ang venous return, tataas ang cardiac output. Pag tumaas ang cardiac output, tataas ang BP, manonormalize po ito. And lastly, your renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism. So, image na lang para mas matandaan natin. So, let's say bumaba ang blood pressure. So, pag bumaba ang blood pressure, konti lang yung blood na papasok kay kidney. Mararamdaman yun, of course, ng ating juxtaglomerular apparatus, the JG apparatus. Sasabihin niya, bakit ang baba ng BP? So, what will it do? It will release renin. So, si kidney will release renin. And then, renin will convert your angiotensinogen na ng liver mo 
into angiotensin 1. At si angiotensin 1 ay mako-convert into angiotensin 2 kapag siya ay inact pa ng ACE. What is ACE? Um, angiotensin converting enzyme na pinoproduce ng iyong lungs naman. So, once ma-produce ng angiotensin 2 or ma-convert na siya into angiotensin 2, ano mga effects niya? Number one, kakaroon ng sympathetic activity. What is the effect of sympathetic? Faster heart rate and fa greater force of contraction. Second effect, magkakaroon ng tubular reabsorption and excretion of water. Okay, marireabsorb daw ang sodium and where sodium is, water will be as well. So, isa pang effect is lalabas ang aldosterone. Ano bang ginagawa ng aldosterone? Tandaan di ba yung N sa aldosterone stands for sodium because sodium is Na. Di ba? So, what will it do? Pag tumas ang aldosterone mo, there will be sodium reabsorption or retention leading to an increase in blood volume. Ano pang magiging effect niya? Magkakaroon ng vasoconstriction sa mga blood vessels. So, pag nag-constrict, ano mangyayari sa BP? Tataas, di ba? And lastly, maglalabas tayo ng ADH or antidiuretic hormone. So, antidiuretic, it prevents urination, di ba? So, ang magtitake effect yung ADH mo sa iyong collectic duct and um, descending loop of Henle. So, what will happen? Magkakaroon ng water reabsorption doon sa areas na iyon. So, hopefully, you'll able to understand that. And that's the end of our discussion. Thank you and shalom.